And I hope they Okay, so hopefully you find this interesting and even if possible inspiring. I am inspired to see that there are a number of younger people in the audience because frankly, I'm midlife at the moment. With any luck, I have another 40 or 50 years ahead of me. But frankly, the future of Japanese traditional architecture doesn't lie with people in my generation, it's the people who come after. And one of the things I think you'll realize over time is those of us who become involved in this world tend to look at ourselves as caretakers rather than owners. And so you are privileged in a way to spend time with a piece of history. And therefore there's a responsibility to pass that on to subsequent generations. Just waiting for this to respond. Here we go. All right, so I am, as they say, Inakamono. I was born and raised in rural New York. There were more cows and apples than there were people. So you can imagine my surprise at living in one of the world's largest cities. And although it's where I live and work during the week, my heart still resides in the countryside. I've been interested in Japan since I was 12 or 13 years old. Nobody in my family, including myself, knows why. There was not a single Asian family in our town. And this was long before the days of the internet. So you can imagine my parents' surprise when in my early teens, I announced that I would live in Japan someday. They patted me on my head and said, uh-huh, oh, that's very nice. And then to their surprise, when I graduated high school, I went to Hawaii, and then after Hawaii, came to Japan. And when I said I was moving to Japan, they were a bit surprised. And I said, I told you this about 20 years ago, so you shouldn't be surprised. I have a background in design and making. I've been a maker in my entire life. I make all my own furniture where possible, audio speakers, design my own car interior. That means that I approach life through a lens of, rather than buying something off the shelf, I seek to make my own statement where possible. Part of it is simply financial. The things that I want, I can't afford to buy. But with a bit of sweat equity, I can make them. I waited until I had permanent residency, or Ejusha, or Ejuken in Japan, before I embarked on this journey. The reason is simple. For those of us who are visitors or long-term residents in Japan, we know that our status here depends upon our visa. And if you are here on a work or student visa, you can still buy property without any trouble at all, as long as you're willing to pay cash. The issue is, of course, if your visa is expired or runs out or is no longer valid, you no longer have the ability to stay in Japan at will, which means that you could come on a recurring tourist visa, but that didn't seem a stable way to move forward for my wife and I. We're both uh, Americans, so we thought that it would be best to wait until we had permanent residency. And we achieved it back when you needed to spend 10 years straight before you could even apply. So we sort of earned it the hard way. The search and purchase took over three years. I looked at over 300 properties online and of those 300, I visited 30 in person over those three years. I'll get more into the details about that in the slide deck, but please understand that although there are numerous minka all around Japan, finding the one that's right for you will take some time and you will be rewarded for patience. The renovation process is seven years and counting. I reckon it'll be a decade all in before I'm done. And as I've told my wife from time to time, I think this is my last renovation. I've done them before and there's a difference now. I, I feel things I didn't feel after moving giant stones and the like. So I've put everything I've had into this last one and I'm hoping it truly is my last renovation. As for future possibilities, neither my wife nor I have any illusion about our permanence. We will come and go like every person before us. We don't have children ourselves. And so the question becomes, what do we do with this property that we've rescued? There are some possibilities. One is attempting to donate it to our town in hopes that they would preserve it as some sort of community center. Another possibility is to look for a young and foolish couple who are willing to take on a monumental task. But if you're familiar with an old movie uh, by the name of Beetlejuice in which a young couple is uh, prematurely killed and wind up haunting the house that they bought, they're horrified 
at the people who come after and <laughs> renovate things differently than they think it ought to be done. So one of the challenges for us would be, how do we ensure that if we do will this to somebody else or give this to some young couple, how do we ensure that they don't turn around and sell it, bulldoze it, flatten all the work that's gone into it? Living trusts and things, they can all be done, but they're complicated. So the future is uncertain, but I suppose it always is. So here's, in general, what we hope to cover today. I wasn't sure who would be in my audience. I didn't know if I would be speaking to a bunch of Kominka experts who would be nodding and shaking their heads at some of the things I was saying. I didn't know if I would be speaking primarily to a Japanese audience, a local audience. I had no idea. So I've put together a slide that I believe a deck covers the gamut and hopefully gives you entry points into the various aspects of what it takes to take this sort of thing on yourself. We can't ignore the Akia problem. We wouldn't be talking about restoring and renovating and saving Kominka if they were already occupied by the families and generations that used to occupy them. So this is something that we need to discuss as well. We move into a Renaissance where thankfully there are increasing numbers of people interested in saving this architectural heritage. And then we'll jump into what does that actually take to do it yourself? There are many paths. And then when you decide to take the plunge yourself, there are some steps you should not skip just to save yourself a bit of misery. So there are far more famous people than I out there who have made excellent quotes. I don't like to insult people by reading to them. So take a moment to enjoy the quote. I'll note that Ms. Onassis was not talking about Japan nor Tokyo, nor was she talking about London or any other world city. She was in the US at the time. What this says to me is that urban renewal is often coupled with the destruction of the past. Different cultures, different countries take different approaches to this. In the UK, for example, heritage is taken rather seriously and there are governmental bodies and local councils that will ensure that things are preserved. One could argue perhaps almost too far to the point that saving them becomes so burdensome that it's easier just to leave a crumbling wall than to actually take on a proper renovation. Japan is almost at the polar opposite of that approach, whereby it's far easier to bulldoze the past and throw up a consumable, disposable future. I think the happy medium lies somewhere between those poles. Let's get into it, shall we? So literally, Kominka had the three characters, old person or local resident and house, most commonly translated as old folk house. But you can hear them sometimes called farmhouses, traditional houses. There is no one set definition. It's easier just to stick with the kanji, frankly. But in general, they predate 1950. And that's when the new building standards law was enacted. This means that any proper kominka will probably not be up to snuff regarding modern seismic measures, for example. However, my house is 133 years old. It was built in Meiji Nijisanem, 1890. That means it made it through the great Kanto earthquake it made it through 9-11, or sorry, 2011 rather, September 11th. It's made it through endless typhoons, including, uh, was it Hagabis in 2019? That scared the bejeebers out of all of us in Tokyo. These houses were built to endure and they use construction techniques that are absolutely brilliant and way ahead of their time in terms of allowing movement. And as a result, Although my house is absolutely not up to modern builder building standard code, I never ever lose a moment's sleep. I trust in something that's made it this far. And they are typically rural. I was amazed to see that there's a place called Pizza Garden, I think, just, is it behind us? And there's a machia 
right next to it, a traditional townhouse. That's fantastic. So that shows that although they are typically rural, they are everywhere if you know where to look. And if you take a moment to look. So there are three main varieties. Well, I really hate standing here, but I realize I have to because of the camera. I tend to move around normally. <laughs> Forgive me for being static. So we have the Noka farmhouse, the Machia merchant house, and the Bukeyashiki clan residence. These are the three most typical styles that you'll come across. And note that they parallel three social divisions in traditional Japan or Japanese society. There are often features typical of each one. However, there is bleed between the categories. In particular, this is fascinating. The bukeyashiki originally had only the straightest, purest grain woods used. After a while, however, the leftovers, if you will, were used by the rural noka farmhouses in particular. Giant, massive beams, but often curved and left in their natural state. Now, after a while, some of, some of the ruling classes looked and said, well, oh, that's, that's quite nice. And they wanted to hmm, have that authenticity of the rural existence. So they intentionally took those beams as well. And so really, depending on the era in which the building was built, you can find that these elements bleed in one to another. Of the three, I would say that the bukeyashiki is the rarest to find on the market. You do find them from time to time. There's one actually for sale now. Um, I think it's in Hyogo Prefecture. So if you look and you use these search terms, you can find them. They're not common. Machia are also a bit harder to find. You'll often find them in Kyoto, Kanazawa, and other traditional cities. By and away, though, far, far and away, here in the Kanto area, you're most likely to have Anoka farmhouse as the easiest option to acquire. In Chiba Prefecture alone, there are hundreds and hundreds of them. And I've looked at a fair few of them. They have typical layouts. Well, this is going to be difficult. Okay, I'm going to have to point from here. Uh, okay. Sorry. Uh, people at home who can no longer see me, pretend you see where I'm pointing. So one of the things to note is that in traditional Japanese architecture, there are zones or layers leading from the outside to the inside. And those relay or rely upon the relationship between the, the visitor and the homeowner. Therefore, the Genkan, the main entrance, is open to anybody. It's often typically unlocked, and it represents a gray zone, although technically within the house. It is pseudo-public space where anyone is able to enter freely and announce themselves. When you go be beyond that, there's usually a hall, and then as you go further and further in, you might find the irori or the hearth, There'll be a series of rooms, and each of these take you a further step into the house, a further step into the family, if you will. And therefore, most guests never get beyond the Genkan. In addition to the formal Genkan, we often have something called the Dolma, which is an earthen floored entrance, typically diatomaceous earth, which is hard packed, hard wearing, antiseptic, and surprisingly clean. The equivalent in Western architecture would be the wet room, where you can come in, take off your wellies, hang up your cloak, whatever it is, but because it's an earthen floor, the dirt stays, and then when you transfer into the main house, you slip into your indoor shoes or your socks, as the case may be. So in most traditional residences, you'll find a genkan, engawa, which is a patio or hallway, depending on how you look at it, doma, which is the earthen floor, Washitsu, which is just a general term, typically for tatami floored rooms, uh, usually separated by fusuma or sliding doors. The tokonoma, which is a special alcove, typically in the fanciest washitsu. And it is used often for displaying the owner's sensibilities, aesthetic sensibilities. And then the irori or the hearth which is a major fire hazard, but is really cool to sit around, which is an open sunken hearth 
and they come in many different flavors as well. And just to give you an idea of what we're talking about, I've looked up some images. Now, I've asked that this slide deck be shared as a PDF with anybody who's interested. So I've made a PDF version of it. And in the PDF version, all of these links are live because I believe in attribution. So these were all found online. And you'll see beneath, I have the site where I found them just for transparency's sake. So this is a somewhat typical GenCon. You can notice a few things straight away. Sorry, I'm going to wander off camera again. No problem. First, there are layers in the form of stairs, as many different ways as you can imagine. Some have giant stone slabs, some have wood, some have rough natural edged wood, others have ceramics. But the idea is that you enter, you leave your shoes here, and then as you step in, you are invited into the house. It is not uncommon in the countryside to just sit here with the homeowner and have a chat. Back when milk was delivered, or a kimono seller might stop by and talk to typically the wife of the family. They would sit and talk, show wares, etc. Notice the beams and also notice the lovely shoji that separate this room from the entrance. That in itself is a topic all on its own. You could spend hours investigating the different schools and construction techniques, etc. Interestingly, for those who are interested in such things, one complete set of these, if you have to go and buy them at a retail shop where they specialize in these sorts of things, can cost you thousands and thousands of dollars US. So there is money to be made in dismantling Minka, which is fortunate or unfortunate, depending on how you look at such things. The Engbawa patio or hallway, depending on how you look at it, marks another one of those transitional spaces between outside and inside. It is not a formal room. It can either be entirely open to the garden or it can have glass doors separating the two. They are typically at least a meter wide. That is intentional so that you can, if you want to, pull up a chair, sit down, have a cup of tea, enjoy the garden without going formally outside. They also typically wrap around the house whether entirely or partially depends upon the house, of course. And typically, they are at least going to be located wherever the best view is, whether that's a view out beyond the house, sometimes called shakke or borrowed scenery, or the garden itself. The domba, as I mentioned, the earthen entranceway. So you can see here, it resembles concrete really more than anything sort of a roughly sanded concrete, if you will. And it, it's quite hard uh, and you have to dig down. Typically you have at least 20 centimeters, but you might have as many as 30 or 40, depending on the house. And it is hard packed. Unfortunately, if they have been covered over time, so if a family put a floor down, for example, once moisture becomes trapped between a floor and the doma, it will begin to break down and deteriorate. So they need to breathe. And in fact, you'll find that breathing is a critical aspect for traditional Japanese architecture. If you renovate a traditional building and you block off the flow of the air beneath the house, you are dooming the house to wet rot and destruction. My uncle, my wife is half Japanese. My uncle is a master carpenter, retired, who lives in uh, near Nagoya. And he told me before I embarked on our journey, you do anything you want to the house, Paul, but make darn sure you keep that floor open. Make sure you allow the wind to blow through the bottom of the house. You can insulate the floor if you wish, but do not stop the airflow. So that's just something to keep in mind. And then there are the washitsu. Typically, it's Tommy mats. Fascinating thing. Did you know that the term jo, so if you have a roku jo room, six tatami mat room. Did you know that the modern tatami mats are smaller than traditional tatami mats? So although you might rent a roku jo room now, it is not actually roku jo. In the same way, modern fusuma, where the sliding doors between rooms are small compared to the traditional or hongusuma as they're called. I learned this when I went to have them redone at a specialist shop and when I brought them into the shop, his eyes got big and he was like, mm -hmm. 
these are real. And that required us to source paper that would fit that size door. So these days with inflation, you'll note that some companies are charging the same price, but they're putting less food or less candy in whatever it is that you're buying. Similar way, the construction industry over time has shrunken the standards, but kept the terms. This is an example of a tokonoma, and this room has a lot to show. So in no particular order, let's start from inside the house, if you will. These are Fusuma, and they are a wooden frame with paper on one or both sides. If they are a closet covering, there's fancy paper on one side and rather plain paper on the other. If they are between rooms, both sides will be covered in fancy paper. Above them is something called Alamma. Alamma is a transom. It is typically open. It's either a carving or lattice work or any other number of designs, but it allows airflow between the rooms, yet provides some measure of privacy. I will hasten to add, not sound. So if you have a family living in a traditional house, everybody gets to hear everything. We have the tatami on the floor, and then here we have the tokonoma. And we have Tenbukuro and Jibukuro. Tenbukuro and Jibukuro are the upper and lower storage areas where you would keep your supplies for the actual tokonoma. Sometimes you'll have shelving or tane involved. You have a specialized beam. And then this itself can be tatami, it can be wood, it can be any number of materials. My uncle told me that in order to speed up looking through all the different houses when I would visit, the first room I should go to is the room that has the tokonoma. If it is made with high quality material, guaranteed the rest of the house has been done to a high standard. So it's a nice heuristic method for evaluating in a quick glance, what great house am I looking at? Then we have shoji, doors and windows, which are screens, and this is quite a high level one. You'll note that the, the, uh, the lattice work is done both with standard rectilinear shapes, but also an inset piece. These are all done by hand. They are exceedingly rare these days because they're easy to break. And they are absolutely amazing to watch. You can sit in this one room all day, do nothing but watch the changing play of light and shadow and find your day not wasted. Are any of you familiar with the book In Praise of Shadows? It's a classic book on Japanese architecture and aesthetics. I highly recommend it. It's a short book, small read, quite interesting and illuminating. It was written, I believe, in the early Taisho period or maybe Meiji, or, uh, Showa, but it's fascinating. Really good read. Gives you insights into the aesthetic and why instead of bright and airy, traditional Japanese houses were built intentionally to obscure light and to play with shadow. And then we come to the hearth, the hirori. Again, a dozen different styles, often regional in nature. However, you can see that they're typically in a very high ceilinged room. It to me is ironic that traditional houses tend to be much more roomy and spacious than modern Japanese houses. Yet, back then, Japanese were much smaller than they are due to nutrition. You have the jizai kagi, which is a hanging pole, which holds your teapot or your cooking pot above the fire. And these can come in brass, they can be made in, in bamboo with carved fish. You can see these for sale if you go to Nikko, for example, at uh, the local curio shops and the like. And typically they are attached with giant thick ropes to a lattice piece or a major beam. And the smoke from the charcoal, typically charcoal, not wood, is allowed to rise and darken the beams and the ceilings. And if the ceiling is made of bamboo, over the 100, 200, 400 years at times that they're in place, they become soot darkened, except where the rope is lashed to tie them together. That material is highly sought as a luxury material to make handbag candles, umbrella things, all sorts of things. And again, when these are broken down, there is a lot of value in those ancient bamboo poles. Myself, 
I like seeing them kept in place in the house. So hopefully now, if you didn't already, you have an idea about what a kuminka is. And in your mind's eye, you can sort of imagine what it would be like to sit in one, to live in one. So the question now is, why aren't more people living in them? Let's look at the Akia problem. Akia means empty house. These two charts tell you much of what you need to know. First, let's look at the population of Japan. Looking from 1990, going to 2020. And of course, the prediction is that this is only going to increase the slope. So Japan is in the vanguard of depopulation in industrialized nations. The reproduction rate is far below the replacement rate needed to keep a stable population. Some people lose sleep about this. We have almost 7 billion people on the planet. I'm not overly concerned that humans are going to run out of babies anytime soon. But certainly on a local level, Japan is going to be one of the first nations to contend with this issue. How do you support an ever growing population of older people with an ever shrinking population of working people? Do you rely on robotics to bring money into the country? Do you open the doors to immigrants? These are questions the Japanese will need to answer. And in short order, in the meantime, what this means is there are fewer and fewer people living in houses. And indeed, if you look at the number of households and the number of units, you can see a gap of about 10 million empty units, uninhabited. Now, there are many reasons for this, which we can get into a little later. But for now, simply realize that many houses, countless houses are empty of all generations. And one of the questions facing younger Japanese and those of us who are residents is, well, if I'm going to buy a house, do I want to buy a modern house or do I want to buy a minka? If you ask a typical Japanese young person, what's important when you're looking for what you wanna buy? They wanna live in the city, not in the countryside. They don't wanna spend very much because there's no value in the house itself. Unlike in most other Western industrialized countries, the moment you buy the house, it depreciates, new or old. Much like a car, drive it off a lot, it's instantly worth less. As a result, the only value is in the land. Therefore, there's no incentive to invest in a house because you're only going to lose money if money is your metric. I'll be honest with you, when we moved into our Minga, it was cold in winter, beyond cold. You could see your breath in every room, no matter how many toyu stoves we lit. Bugs would visit us throughout the year. We had a hakubishi, a, a civet cat, living in the ceiling. Imagine trying to go to sleep at night and hearing. <laughs> I heard, Paul, it's in the house, more times than I care to remember. They are made of wood and packed earth. That ages, and the walls in particular break down over time. They hold up amazingly well, but they're, they're waddle and dog. They break down. Minka are dirty. Dirt is always falling down from the ceiling. The packing in the roof breaks down over time. And if you get up above the ceiling and into the beams, you'll see a layer about 10 centimeters thick of dirt and dust over the 100, 200 years that's been there. Now, can you deal with this? Absolutely. A shock vac, a mask, a lot of sweating, a bit of cursing, 
and you can clean up this area. But not many people want to do that. I didn't want to do it, but I had to do it. And then there's sort of the cachet. If you ask a young person for the same amount of money, do you want to live in a high rise near Kagurazaka or something? Or do you wanna live in a 200 year old house with a lovely garden? 9.9 .9 times out of 10, they're gonna go for the city. So these four C's add up to a big problem for traditional houses outside of the city. As I said, you can find them in the city. They often come with eye-watering prices because of the land. When I was doing the search for hours, I saw a beautifully restored minka in the heart of Tokyo for a bargain price of 8 million US. Maybe we have a billionaire among us who we go, yeah, why not? I looked and went, oh, yeah, never. So uh, they are there, but they're much harder to come by in the city, at least in city center. So let's talk about where we are. First, inheritance taxes cause most properties to be subdivided. So in other words, if you inherit a house that's worth 400,000, expect to pay about 200,000 in taxes. Not many families have those cash reserves. As a result, they're forced to sell the property to pay off the inheritance tax. They are typically bought by developers who take a once large property and subdivide it to make a profit on their investment. You do that for four generations, half, half again, half again, half again, you wind up with the postage stamp sized lots that we see now with houses built with zero window or envelope around them so you can reach out and touch your neighbor's house. If you could go back in time, 100 years, each of these places that you see six or eight houses with no yards at all were typically a nice home with a well-tended garden. Inheritance tax is an issue, and there's also the issue of property tax. Property tax is six times more expensive if a lot is empty than if there's a building on it, even if that building is in a terrible shape. What that means is there's a perverse financial incentive for families to keep derelict buildings standing because the moment they tear it down, their taxes go up six times. Now, on the one hand, this is an issue because as you know, empty homes left to rot become havens for mice, other vermin, they're a fire hazard. They're often full of old materials and things, even asbestos, not when they were originally built, but if they were renovated in the 1940s or 50s, asbestos was highly used for tiles and things like that. So one, you've got an issue where it's not in the family's own interest to tear down anything. On the other hand, if it were beneficial to tear them down, we'd have even fewer minka now than we do. It is literally a race against time. The house that my wife and I bought had been completely empty for five years, but for the previous five years before that, it was sort of empty as the mother that was living there went in and out of hospital. So we were looking at a house that had not been properly attended in a decade. And I reckon we caught it just in time. Beyond that, the damage becomes too severe for most people to deal with. So tax law is the base of the issue. Without addressing tax law, we will always have an uphill battle. Population trends we talked about earlier, fewer buyers, urban preferences, means if you have empty houses, they're also gonna be in the countryside. And then consumer preferences. I've often wondered, when you look at modern Japanese housing, at least standalone home units, the ikotate, they're very uninspiring. They're made of horrible materials, plastic typically. They're built like Lego pieces that pop together rather quickly. They're meant to last 20 or 30 years, basically the life of the mortgage. 
then they're meant to be torn down, the land sold, and a new house put up. Now that in and of itself doesn't mean that it has to be ugly. And yet very often modern Japanese houses are. No sense of proportion, poorly placed windows. And I, I, the question I ask myself is, is it that Japanese developers, Sekisui, Daiwa, all the big companies, are they in fact offering homes that young Japanese want? Or is it the other way? where they have found a model that is cheap for them with a high profit margin, and then they market that going, you may choose one of these five things. And the modern buyer goes, we'll take number seven, as the case may be. I don't know the answer to that, but it is something that interests me. I can tell you that when young Japanese have visited our home, invariably they're like, wow, this is gorgeous. I'd love to live in this house. So I think there's a recognition of the beauty of traditional architecture. I just don't think it's available or accessible for many young people today, particularly when you consider the financial situation that many young people find themselves in. After three plus decades of poor economic performance, the idea of uh, a meaningful career with gainful employment and a decent amount of money to raise a family is a vanishing dream for many of the young generation. And that's another issue that I think needs to be addressed if we're actually going to see a shift in how housing is approached. But it's not all doom and gloom. The simple fact is, in the last decade in particular, there has been an increasing interest in saving these houses. I think it's always important to respect those who came before you and to give respect to those who trail blazed before everyone else. The earliest example I can find post-war were Takishita Yoshihiro and John Roderick. Uh, in 1967, John was a journalist and he became interested in Minka, purchased one with Takishita-san from elsewhere in Japan and moved it to Kamakura. If you're interested in their story, there is a beautiful video that the New York Times posted. You do a search, you'll find them. And the video is achingly beautiful to watch, both the building and the friendship between the two men. And to this day, Takishita-san actually finds Minka, takes them apart, stores them in warehouses, and then tries to find people who are interested in buying them and moving them elsewhere. So what started as sort of a, a young boyish dream has become a lifetime's work for him. Unfortunately, uh, Mr. Roderick passed away in Hawaii, I think five or six years ago. Maybe not quite that far. Alex Kerr, who's still in Japan, in the early 1970s, he picked up an ancient house, I, I, several hundred years old in Shikoku, renovated it, and it's still standing. Uh, it's used as a local uh, attraction by the local community there. And he's gone back and forth. I believe he's lived in Thailand for a bit as well, but he is now uh, involved again in Japan. He helps municipalities, small towns, locate a minka in their village, renovate it, and try to turn it to on a paying basis into some sort of accommodation, sort of like an Airbnb or something like that. Pairing that idea of making a property turn a profit, I think is brilliant because it's one of the few things that can make people go, oh, there's value in saving this building. And then Carl Bengs is a German who came to Japan to study martial arts and wound up becoming getting involved in this movement. And in Niigata, I believe it is, he has sort of rebuilt a village one house at a time. And what's brilliant, in my opinion, is he does not restore so much as he renovates. And he blends his German sensibility with the traditional architecture and then creates a new hybrid and then finds people who are interested and buy them. And house by house, he has repopulated a village, which I think is amazing. All three of these individuals have cut a trail for the rest of us to follow. 
and given us an example that allows us to think, I could do this. This is possible. Now, these days, the internet is ubiquitous. And as a result, we have the opportunity to spread our message in a number of different ways. If you are a YouTube person, uh, you can see that Tokyo Lama is an account of a fellow in Ibaraki Prefecture, I believe it is, who has renovated a traditional house and he's recorded the entire process from start to finish. He has a, a three, 400,000 subscribers, I believe. One of his videos has something like 3 million views. There's real interest here. And he's, he's funny, he's very self-deprecating. He shows the ups and the downs. It's a very amusing channel to watch. I highly recommend it. There's also Minka Japan, a nonprofit organization. I had a small hand in helping launch. I'm no longer involved with it, but I definitely cheer them on. Um, if you follow this QR code, you'll see that there's a Minka summit in Kyoto in, I think it's April, and there'll be tours and workshops and um, inspirational speakers and the like. So if you're interested, hit this QR code later, follow it through. And if you have a chance to visit Kyoto, why not? Uh, and then obviously modern news. I had my 15 minutes of fame when CNN did a story about us in 2020. During the pandemic, people were sick to death, no pun intended, of being stuck inside. And escapism was a real attraction. So to see a pair of expats like us who were crazy enough to do something unusual, last count, there were over 8 million views of that story. And although my email is not publicized, and I didn't think it was visible anywhere on the net, the day after that story came out, my inbox was flooded with people from all over the world asking me, how did you do it? Can you help me do it? What's, what am I going to do? And that kept up for about half a year. And I believe in paying it forward. So when people contacted me, I take time out. And I had noticed that there were similar questions over and over again. So I put together a small package. Here are some sites to use. Here are some things to do, et cetera. And then it became easier when people contacted me, go, here's your starter kit. Good luck. <laughs> All right. So you've made it this far. You're thinking to yourself, what do I want to do? You have some options. Restoration, renovation, relocation, or reclamation. Restoration, and these are my definitions, so feel free to dispute them. Reclamation, sorry, restoration is restoring the house using traditional methods, traditional materials to an original status. How far you want to go is entirely up to you. Do you want to rip out the electrics if it was a 400-year-old house? Your business, not mine. Do you want to stop at the Taisho era? and keep the ceramic insulators and run new wires along those insulators. It's up to your choice, but the goal of restoration is to restore it to an original condition. Contrast that with renovation, which is the path I've chosen, and that is to keep the bones, if you will, but then apply modern comfort and convenience. I believe in keeping a happy wife. That means, keeping a house that's warm, clean, friendly, and convenient. So we've added insulation. I had a custom made set of double glass wooden frame doors and windows made in Niigata. Damn near cost as much as the purchase price of the house. <laughs> However, last year when I didn't have them, the typical indoor temperature of the house in winter was five degrees before I turned on the wood stove and the gas heaters and such. This year, with those windows in place, average temperature in morning before I turn on the heaters, between 10 and 12. And since then, I've begun putting in all the insulation ceiling, the ceiling insulation. So the floor is ins insulated already. The walls and windows are now insulated. The capstone will be the ceiling. I reckon next winter, I'm shooting for a minimum of 15. 15 is nothing. 15 is easy. If you can take five, 15 is luxurious. Relocation. Now, relocation is generally a full rebuild. You buy a Minka somewhere in Japan, have it disassembled piece by piece with numbers, and then a specialty company will relocate it for you and build it on new ground. Typically, that is combined with renovation. However, I have seen it done with restoration as well. 
depends. Price per square meter is more than a new build using cheap materials, but not terribly more. And what you wind up with is a bespoke home that should last for hundreds of years if taken care of. And then there's reclamation. Honestly, not all houses can be saved, but that doesn't mean that all the materials need to go to rack and ruin. So it is perfectly acceptable if you find one that's too far gone to save what beams you can. They are typically made of materials that you cannot buy anymore. I'll give you an example. In our house, one set of suma, so four doors, are made with ichimai ita keaki. Uh, they are made from Japanese elm, one single piece. And that piece is, I don't know, a, a meter point two by two meters four panels. You cannot buy that material new anymore. The doors, the shoji doors in some of our rooms are made of the highest quality, very fine detail. The main beam of the house is Japanese elm and it is 30 centimeters square. So these materials, even if the rest of the house is shot, are still worth saving. You can use them to rebuild another minka, you could also bring them into a modern house and do a hybrid. So these are the four main things that you can do with something you purchase. If any of you are rock climbers, you'll know the expression, choose your own line. Picture yourself at the bottom of a cliff. So you're looking up at a sheer rock wall to climb. You will see a different line, a different path up the face than I will. And if you attempt to follow my line, you stand a high risk of falling. It's really important that if you find somebody who inspires you, that's great. But don't try to simply mimic or copy exactly what they've done. Each one of us has a different budget, a different set of skills, a different amount of time available to us, a different timeline that we need to meet to get something built. So you need to know for yourself, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Who can you leverage or access to help you if needed? What are your priorities? Once you have those in place, then you stand a chance of making a good plan. I have seen people rush in, buy a Minka fairly cheaply, and then about half a year, a year into it, realize they are way in over their heads and wind up abandoning the project. Sometimes in worse shape than when they first found it because they'd begun the demolition and it was only after the partial demolition had started that they realized they were in for much more than they originally thought. So choose your own line. If I haven't scared everybody off, let's talk about taking the plunge. One of my favorite expressions, failing the plan, is planning to fail. I also like the five Ps, proper preparation prevents poor performance. Planning is critical. A lot of people only look at the purchase price, and that's important, but realize the materials, especially now in this time of shortage caused by the strife in Ukraine, coronavirus, all the disruptions that we've seen, are skyrocketing. And you need to know how much you're going to have to spend on materials or else you could find yourself with a gaping hole in the house and nothing to fill the hole. Labor. How much of this can you do yourself? Genuinely. Or who are you going to have to pay? And are you going to pay a local contractor or are you going to plump and pay for a proper shopping son, an artisan? a person who knows how to use the traditional materials. The difference in price is astounding. And then don't forget, government and business always take their cut. I'll give you an example. In addition to our omoya, the main house, we have a kura, or a earthen walled storehouse on our property. Fairly big, Nanajuhebe, uh, about 70 square meters. It was in horrible shape when we bought it. The outermost layer of uh, shikui, uh, plaster, was pretty much gone. And the bamboo forest that surrounded the house had fallen in in many places and damaged the roof, which allowed water to get in, which damaged great sections. 
Now we had just bought the house, didn't really have any money at all left over, but we knew that we had to put our efforts into saving that building first. So I contracted, contacted some local contractors and also specialists. The local contractor using a mix of old and new material would do it for about 30,000 US. The traditional artisan who used only the old techniques and materials wanted more than 100,000 US. As much as I wanted to do the traditional, there was no way I could afford that. So we compromised. And you are going to have to make those compromises yourself, unless you made a money, in which case, you be you, do everything traditionally, because that's obviously the best way to go for it if you can swing it. Whether you're single or part of a mad couple, you need to get your wish lists in order. I'll give you mine and my wife's. Mine was in no particular order. I wanted a kura. If possible, I wanted a nagayamo, which is a storehouse that's also an entry point or gate. I wanted a temple nearby so that I could hear the bells in the evenings. I wanted a river nearby, close enough to bicycle to, but not so close that it would be a flood risk. I wanted a michi no eki or a farmer's market nearby so that I could bicycle to the place and get fresh fruits and veggies. I wanted the town to be fairly flat so that I could bicycle. I wanted to be near enough to Tokyo that I could get to it by car without too much trouble, but not so close to Tokyo that it would be crowded and full of ugly buildings. I wanted, where possible, something like uh, kaidan tansu, which are stairs and cabinets all in one piece. So I had a list about, I don't know, 10 or 12 things. My wife's wish list was electricity, modern toilet, yeah, mostly electricity and modern toilet. Those are the two things on, on her wish list. She had a much more modest list than I did, which did help because imagine if her list was radically different from mine and she wanted something entirely different. So whether you're on your own or whether you're a part of a couple or some new commune of people, of artisans that are gonna go, you know, eight people in and rebuild it all together, Make sure you agree on the wish list. It'll save you endless arguments later. Typically, these are the sorts of things she wants to consider. And of them, I would focus on the intangibles, believe it or not. Because population density, natural hazards, the odds of development, the landscape, the soundscape. Will you hear urban crickets, sirens, ambulances in the letter? What are your neighbors like? Visit the property in the morning, midday, at night, during the week, on the weekend. You're in this for the long haul. You'd better make sure that it's the right place for you to land. All of these go into a table. So let's look at an example. We have three potential properties. A farmhouse built in 1870, a machia built in 1920, and a yashiki done in 1760. One's in Maibashi, <clears throat> which is Gumba, one's in Hoku, Yamanashi, and one's in Hitachinaka, which is the coast of uh, Hibaraki. The farmhouse happens to have a Nagaya mall. Heck yeah, plus five. But the machia has some amazing kusuma and a kaidan concept. The yashiki has a kura, a mon, a formal entry gate, and an ike, an actual pond, and a real pond, not some airsats one with a pump, one that's properly fed by water, therefore you don't have to worry about it going rotten. In terms of size, the farmhouse has kihakutsubo, big plot of land, that's about uh, 3,000 square meters, or three quarters of an acre, depending on how you had to use. The machia, not surprisingly, only has 80 tsubo because it's in the middle of it now. And then the uh, yashiki has about 500, so pretty big, not quite as big as the farmhouse. And then let's look at the price. One's listed for uh, 2,500 mon or about uh, 25 million. One's 5 million, one's 30 million. Now, you will have heard that towns are giving these things away, that you can get a minka for $2 and the town will pay you to rebuild it. Yeah, not really, no. 
I would say bare minimum, you should expect to pay at least 5 million yen to find one that's in decent enough shape to actually rebuild on your own. You go much cheaper than that. Typically the damage is so bad that unless you are a master carpenter with friends who are also master plumbers, electricians, et cetera, it's gonna to be too much. But around the five mil mark, they seem to be basically livable. So what you do is you color code. So in this example, there are only these four things, location, feature, property, price. Our table that my wife and I constructed had about 15 different columns, right? Because of all the different things we were looking for. And then in this case, I simply color coded from light to dark, where dark is the most desirable. The reason you do this is, I believe that in order for data to be useful, it should be visible, visualized. You can see, if this person wanted to live near the coast, Tachinaka takes the cake because both of these are inland. But Kofu happens to be in a beautiful area where there are mountains and amazing fruit and vegetables. So it actually gets the nod over Maibashi in this hypothetical example. Of the three different features, this person preferred to have Kura, Amon, and Ike. But the farmhouse wins out because they wanted lots of land. And then obviously everybody wants it as cheap as possible. So in this instance, the Machia wins that. But if you look at this, you'll see that of the three, for this particular person, the Yashiki best meets their criteria. And the reason I suggest that you use a table like this is you can become emotionally swayed by a single feature sometimes of a property. And that's not wrong, but it sometimes can cause you to overlook other things. And by taking a moment to step back, put these into a table, rank them, and get a sense overall of which compromises you're going to choose, and there will always be compromises, you're in a better position to make a more logical, rational purchase. That said, I would say that anybody buying a Minka is not really making a rational purchase. <laughs> It's an emotional purchase as much as anything. So let's go through what it takes to actually find one. Right now, we've all talked in hypotheticals. So Inaka Gurashi is a website that helps people find rural properties. And you can see that they're listed by region and then by prefecture. And they often have a photo to tell you what's on offer. If you do not speak, read, or write Japanese, that is not a deal breaker. If you use Chrome or any modern browser, it can often translate these things. So Japanese is not an obstacle if you don't have Japanese ability yourself or access to somebody who does. I clicked on that one first picture that you saw on the previous slide, and this is what came up. So, in Kachiota uh, Sea, in uh, Isobe town, near this JR station, there was a property with fairly large plot of land. And the house itself, not bad, 165 square meters. It's pretty good. If you think about what most people rent in Japan, in the cities, for an apartment, what are you looking at? 45 square meters, 60 square meters? This is downright luxurious. It was built in Showa 63, which is not very old at all, right? I, I'm born in Showa 44, so it's younger than I am. And it's a 4LDK. And here's the contact information. Now, that's okay. With this, there were about two pictures. That's not very much to go on. That's not really even enough to know, do you wanna take the time to visit it? And these sites always play coy with the address. They'll give you the town, and sometimes a subdivision of the town, but no more. However, if you are persistent, you can find more information. And I'll show you what I mean. I put in the address and the list price. And sure enough, eight other websites had more information and more photos of the same house. So I looked and went, oh, hell yes. I could see from this construction that this was done using traditional joinery. I looked at the tokonoma, the jibukuro, the tenbukuro. I looked at the shoji. Whoever built this house, they put heart and soul into it, or they paid someone else to. I looked at the genkan. I looked at the flow through the floors, and I looked at the greenery outside. 
And I thought, hmm, tell me more. So now that I'm curious, but I don't want to talk to an agent yet. I just want to find the place on my own. How do you go about doing that? Well, some of the pictures were from outside. And looking at the outside, I could tell what type of roof was used and the layout of the buildings on the property. I also knew just from the general address given that it had to be within the red line. Patience, patience, and more patience. Using what I knew about the roofs and the layout, I searched aerially until I found the house. Here it is. <laughs> this is using nothing but Google Maps, a free tool that we all have access to. Now, automatically, I see some things that catch my eye that dampen my enthusiasm a little bit. This is a train line, literally a stone's throw, one of the houses. Now, this is out in the middle of nowhere, relatively speaking, no offense to anybody who lives in this town. So that means that the trains are not going to be overly common, but that does mean you are going to hear them. And if you've ever lived near a train line, you know that it can reverberate through the house. So I went, yeah, okay, well, that, that's a minus. Then I zoomed out just a wee bit to get a sense of what does the rest of the immediate neighborhood look like? Lo and behold, here's our house here. This is a major marble processing center. Marble dust. Mm, who doesn't want to breathe that? So that's another minus. However, just over here, you don't see it because I need to fit it on the slide. There was a grape farmer where you go pick your own grapes. Plus 10, go on. You have to be a bit demented to do this, to sit and spend hours staring at Google Maps, finding these houses will cause, if you have a partner, will cause your partner to look at you with some concern. But it's a cheap hobby, relatively speaking. Then using Google Street View, I wanted to see what did the property look like from the road. So I noticed one, huge lot and traditional stone lanterns or ishiko. Also, mature trees. There's also ajisai, uh, Chinese company, I forget the Japanese name for that one. So it's a mature garden. Here is the entrance. Holy moly. These are granite pavers. And this is granite gate. And this is the local green stone and that's a granite top. This wall, Nowadays, would be hundreds of thousands of dollars to build, easily. So the inside and the outside of the house confirm my suspicions. Whoever built this was wealthy and put everything they had into building the nicest house they could. Not the best location. Proper preparation prevents poor performance. Some people add a safety is poor performance. You're going to live here. With modern climate change concerns, things like flooding, earthquakes, landslides are real issues. Look at what happened to uh, cities like Kumamoto down south. And that's only going to increase. If you remember 2019, Typhoon Hegebus, the typhoon was literally bigger than Japan itself. So you need to take into account hazards. The brilliant thing is every Japanese town I have ever researched has a hazard map. So looking at this hazard map, here's a local train station, and here is the property we're looking at. Notice here is white, and then it goes sort of a tangerine, and then it gets darker and darker and darker, and there's an arrow. The thing is there's a river just here. And this represents an inundation map. Now, every inundation map gives you the direction of the flood, but also the depths. And we were in the tangerine zone, if you remember. That means that you face a 0.5 to a three meter flood. An additional map showed 
and we're here's that station. So we're here in the light blue. This shows how long the water will stay. Light blue, you have 12 hours of standing water in the event of a flood. I want you to think about how amazing this is. That from the comfort of my living room with a glass of scotch in my hand, I was able to determine all of this within 45 minutes. Now, granted, I am practiced at finding the houses using the roofs. It takes you a little bit at first, but you get used to it. And it's fun. It's addictive. Now, knowing this, you turn to your partner or yourself or your group of friends, and you say, is this something we want to do? The asking price on this property was about uh, 35 mil. So San Zengo Hyakuma, about not a small number, small compared to what people pay in Tokyo for a house, but still substantial. Do you want to go for it knowing what you know about the conditions? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. It's a very personal relationship to risk that you need to consider. Before I go into the closing costs, just to give an idea of what you're facing, if you choose to purchase one, do realize that there are people out there both Japanese and foreigners, who are willing to do this work for you. But I was amazed at what they charge for it. So I was contacted about a month ago by a woman living in America who had seen the article on CNN, reached out, and said that she was interested in moving to Japan. She was retiring. She had a certain amount of money. She could pay cash for the property. And she was reaching out to people to help her do some legwork. There was a pair of gentlemen, foreigners in Japan, who offered to give her a database access, which had houses and locations and things. And they were going to charge hundreds and hundreds of dollars to her for the same information I can get for free by putting in about 45 minutes of my own time. Now, granted, I'm really practiced at this, but even if you're new as new to the process, if you know the fundamentals of good web searching, you can do this. Now, if you wanna pay them their fee and have them do it for you, by all means, time and money, that's your own personal decision. But I found it a bit galling to think that somebody was going to charge hundreds and hundreds for something that you could do very easily on your own. Let's say you go to buy it. Now, in many places around the world, closing costs are split between seller and buyer. In Japan, however, the buyer bears all costs. I mean, you can try to get the other person to pay. Good luck. Here are the typical closing costs on a house that's going to cost about 35 million. You've got stamp tax, and if the house is between 10 and 50 mil, it's only each month, 10,000 yen. So you're like, yeah, I'm in there. However, the registration tax is 1.5% of the land value, 0.3% of the building value, 0.4% of the mortgage value if you have a mortgage. In this case, that adds up to a whopping 700000 A little bit of an ouch. Then there's acquisition tax, which is different than the registration tax. And it's 1.5 of the land and 3% of the building value. Now, the good news is, for most Minka, the building's worth nothing or almost nothing. So that does minimize the tax. But do be aware, it's there. And that, in this case, it would be about 750000 then there's a brokerage fee, 3%, plus 60,000 flat fee, plus consumption tax. In this case, 1.2 mil. Yikes. And then the city gets its cut with the fixed asset tax and the city tax. One's for the land, one's for the building. It's to the city. In this case, it's typically 1.7% of the base price. Now, the base price is not the selling price. It's sort of the assessed value. So typically in rural areas, you're looking at 200 or less. However, altogether, 2.8 mil. Now remember, the purchase price was 35 mil. Now you're looking closer to 38 mil. No big deal if you know about that going in. I had no idea when we bought ours. And when we went to closing time and they said, oh, we need an additional roughly this much, not quite, but still close. I went, oh, which organ can I sell? That was the sort of situation we were in. We made it happen, 
but it was a really unpleasant surprise and I would spare you that. So you've done your due diligence. You found your house. You did all your research. You bought the house. Now it's yours. Now what? I would recommend that you do this before you buy. Some people do it after. There are specialists for Omega, but a typical housing inspector can do it for you. Or if you're a skilled builder yourself, I did my own inspection. So the big ones, termites, shibari. These are insidious <laughs> because the damage is often hidden. Whether it's live or an extincter, or a extinct's not the right word. Anyway, if the termites are no longer there, the damage is still there. And typically they will be located mostly where moisture has accumulated. So the bathrooms, the kitchen, etc. Wet rot or shihuhai. That's floors and damage, uh, damaged roofs. If you have a damaged roof, whether it's uh, straw, thatch, or tile, whatever, if it's been damaged and water has been allowed to get into the beams, it will rot the beams. And you can be horrified how far that damage spreads as the water travels through the wood. And what became a bargain now become a millstone around your neck. Likewise, with the floor, you need to know whether at least the main beams and pillars of the house are sound. When we bought our house, I swear to you I'm not exaggerating. If you know the old Indiana Jones movie where the third one, where he needed to walk on only some stones. Yeah. That was our living room. When guests visited us, we would say, don't sit anywhere you see the tape. And don't move that chair. You may only sit there. Odd way to greet people. Wonderful sobriety test. Though. re -roofing. We were lucky. The previous owner in our house, upon his retirement, had received his retirement payout and used all of it to re-roof the house about 40 years ago. Tile, if it's taken care of, can last about 80 years. So that was a real savings for us because re-roofing a tile a roof can be 100,000 or more US. So it's nothing you wanna take on if you can avoid it. If you go with thatched roofing, they are gorgeous. But the craftsmen, my battery is running low, FYI. Oh, okay. The craftsmen who know how to do that can be hard to find and the material is getting harder to find. Due to the resurgence, there are more people doing it, but it's still not something easy. So do consider that in terms of when you're looking at roofs. And then of course, mizumori and the electrical, the denki haisen. If it's a traditional house, pretty much the wiring is going to be an absolute nightmare and a proper fire hazard. So you're gonna to wanna to have somebody come in and do that for you straight away. As for the plumbing, depends on how tolerant your wife is. Okay, so that's what made the 101. Hopefully you found this interesting. It was never going to be encyclopedic in its coverage because it's just too much to go into here. I tried to provide you all with an overview of what we have, why we have it, and what to do if you decide to go and take the plunge yourself. Do it for the adventure. Do it for the feeling you get when you sit down on your own veranda with a cup of tea in hand and look back at where the house was. I've photographed our entire journey. And when I'm having a rough day at work, I'm a, I, I run an international school in Tokyo. My job is strictly cerebral. I'm dealing with people problems all day long. And no matter how old I get, my students stay the same age and they make the same mistakes every single year. <laughs> And so it feels like I'm holding back the ocean with a broom. But when I go to my Minka and I put in a weekend of backbreaking labor, there's a before and then after. And when I look at the pictures seven years ago, and when I'm sitting in my living room now, I can't tell you how satisfying that is. And every single guest we've had at our house, Japanese and foreign, wealthy and poor, every single one of them have said, that they've never been in a more relaxing home. And that's not because of my hospitality. The house is all natural materials and there's an open flow. And we've removed every bit of plastic we could find. And there's an old wind up tick tock pendulum clock. And you will sit there 
and you will watch birds and animals go out in the garden and you'll hear nothing but the ticking of a clock and you'll see the light change throughout the day across the building. It's one of the most peaceful things I can think of. Well worth the effort. I think you should give it a go yourselves. Thank you. I think I went a bit over. I, I, it's okay. I, I think I think I might have found the power cord. Oh. Yeah. Perhaps. Uh, well, while we're doing that, does anybody who know how to use a computer? Oh, there we go. Okay. Do you have any questions? Yeah. So, um, that. that 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 was getting to my next point was um, we do have a couple minutes for questions. If uh, if people are joining us on Zoom, I guess the, the easiest thing to do is just to uh, to turn on your mic and uh, and and share your question. If you're here in the room, um, please raise your hand and I, I please work. <laughs> Thank oh, you for working. Almighty oh, gods of technology. And before I forget, um, Paul mentioned before that his uh, slides are in PDF form. And if anybody would like a copy of that, send me an email. Um, people on Zoom already have my email address because I, I've sent you the, uh, the, the the invitation. But anybody who's here who doesn't have it, let's let's talk afterwards, and uh, and I can I can share that with you. We have a question right here, I believe. This way, everybody on Zoom can hear you. Excuse the mic. Thanks. Uh, thank you. It was a truly inspiring talk, and um, I would love to rush off and get going right now. I have done a little bit of media house hunting hmm. um, and failed uh, spectacularly at every turn. Hmm. And the one that I lost my heart to um, has also been lost because it sort of transpired that the owner did not want to sell to a foreigner. Hmm. Have you any suggestions about how to get around this difficulty? I think it's a common one. I've heard from friends that they'd rather let the house fall down than disgrace the ancestors by selling it to the people not in the family. I would push back a little on that. I would say that it's not uncommon. However, typically it's been more about concern for the neighbors than for the house itself. The idea being that the family who owns the house have connections going back sometimes generations in that location. And they therefore feel a responsibility for introducing a new person to that village. Note, it is not just foreigners. I've had Japanese people moving from Kyushu into Kanto and running into similar problems. So it's really more of um, a local mindset, maybe provincial mindset might be a better way to put it, rather than say nationality driven. However, one way that you can do that is by going through a single agent and allow the agent to do a fair bit of the legwork for you. And then the agent can sort of vouch for you, particularly if you have bona fides in Japan. So for example, oh, this person has done this, that, or the other. They've been involved in this movement. They know these people. It's really the social side of things that help you get past that. Other than that, thick skin and moving on and not becoming to attach to a property before it's yours. I will say of the 30 that I went to see in person out of the 300 that I looked in, not a single time was I turned down uh, for anything. I, I was like, no, okay, no, actually I'm not gonna go for that one. So I think it might be rarer than many people suspect, but when it does happen, it can be heartbreaking, absolutely. Hmm. Also, if you connect with things like the uh, Kominka Japan group, you can often have recommendations for, oh, here's a property here, there's a property there, because you're going to be introduced by somebody, you know, shokai sarita. It makes a big difference because in a way they're vouching for your good character. Sorry. We have uh, another question over here. It's going to be a good one. Good. It's from somebody named Paul. Yes. <laughs> It's a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. You mentioned three foreign people who will not be mm. active like you, so you make four. Uh, how about the Japanese people? Uh, especially now, as has happened in other countries, people are more and more permitted to work from home. Mm. Uh, is there going to be a trend of, of younger Japanese people 
we used to be prefer to live centrally, of finding it more possible to live outside and will that affect the market and so on? Well, first, absolutely yes. And you'll note that one of the examples I had had Takishita san. So one of the trailblazers was in fact Japanese. However, if you go on YouTube in particular and do a search in Japanese for Kominka renovation, you will find that there are not hundreds and hundreds, but at least scores of young Japanese who go in with a cheeky attitude and a great sense of humor and record all the travails and the triumphs. And typically they tend to be pretty much dirt poor. So it's all about sweat equity and really ingenious solutions to solving some of their problems. And they're an absolute hoot to watch. They're, they're truly heartwarming and charming. So by all means, um, we should, I think, cheer them on by liking and subscribing so that they get recognition for that. And then you're right. With coronavirus and the big reset and people realizing that living in the city may not be all that it's cracked up to be and also seeking a better work-life balance, there is a trend to try to work remotely. And because Japan has such fantastic infrastructure in terms of internet, et cetera, that's really not a barrier. So I do believe that this is part of that resurgence, but whether it's a blip or a trend, I, I think it's it's too soon. There aren't enough data points for me to prognosticate. Thank you. Are there any more questions? I don't see anybody raising their hand or anything at home. I, I, I think you you told us everything that we could possibly want to know. Yeah. In other words, the middle-aged man talked and talked and talked. Sorry about that. There were many people saying thank you. Oh, I checked it on my computer. Hmm. Okay. Um, well, before we say good night, proper preparation prevents poor or performance. Right, that's one thing to take away, and uh, also, so now let's let's give a big round of applause to. I do hope that you give it a go, at least consider it. Begin going online, start doing the crazy thing of searching and finding ones. You may find one that hooks your heart, and you could be someone who helps save a house that will be passed on. Some of these houses are 400 years old. It would be a terrible loss to the history and the culture of Japan for them to be lost. What they need is a caretaker. It's hard work, it's really hard work, but it's very rewarding work. It, it's one of the most rewarding things I've done. Give it a go. Good night, everybody. <laughs>